I want artificial intelligence to take my job. I'm sure you've never heard anyone say that and say it with such a big smile, but I really mean it, and I think by the end of my talk, you might understand why. In my job, I'm an astronomer. I explore the universe using physics and try to understand the meaning of it all. It's a big question. In my job, it means that the night sky is my work office. This is both a wonderful thing and a terrible thing at the same time. It's wonderful because the universe is infinitely beautiful and almost infinitely interesting. It's terrible because the universe is frighteningly big, like really, really big. Just looking at an image like this, I feel insignificantly small. I look up and I see thousands of stars in that big grand structure that we call the Milky Way. For hundreds and thousands of years, this was our view of the cosmos, to human eyes at least. This was our universe. It wasn't until the 17th century when the invention of the telescope occurred that we began to peer beyond this. When we did, boy, did we find some good stuff. It didn't take long, but astronomers found hundreds and hundreds of these fuzzy, nebulous-looking things. They confused us for a very long time, and in 1929, Edwin Hubble confirmed that these were, in fact, galaxies far, far away. It turns out, in every direction you look, every point of the sky, you see more and more of these distant galaxies. And nothing represents this fact quite as well as this image here. Taken using the James Webb Space Telescope, one of the first images ever released, what you're looking at is 10,000 galaxies in a single image. If we were to try count all of the stars, there would be over one trillion of them. And it's just remarkable. It is impressive in itself, but it's about to become mind-blowing because this image is just the tiniest pinpoint on the sky. It's about as big as a grain of sand if you hold it in your fingertips and point it out as far away from you as you can. A little pinpoint on the sky. 10,000 galaxies. We can use images like this to estimate that in our universe we expect there should be about 6 trillion individual galaxies observable. Some really big numbers. So back to my job as an astronomer. I didn't know what to expect when I first started. I thought maybe someone would plonk me on a telescope and I'd look at a handful of galaxies and I would discover new things and live a very happy life. None of that was true except for living the very happy life. What happened on my first day was my supervisor showed me this. This is an image taken with one of the biggest cameras we've ever developed on the Earth. It's called the Dark Energy Camera. It sits on a telescope in Chile and what you see here is over 500 million pixels in a single image spread over 62 CCDs. If we count all of the astronomical sources in that image, we would get over 300,000 of them. It's a lot of data. So I was stoked. I'm like, excellent, this is my data, this will be my PhD. And so my supervisor said, yes, but you have 10,000 of them. 10,000 images like this, each with 300,000 sources minimum, that was, that was my work. I had to go through them all and figure out what was important, what was interesting, what was new physics. As you can imagine, this is incredibly overwhelming. And it, this is where machine learning and artificial intelligence comes in to save my days, save my years. I did the quick calculations to figure out if I looked at each source individually, how long would that take me? It can't be too long, right? If I was to look at all 10,000 images, every single source, I'd be sitting there for seven years. But seven years, no sleep, no breaks, no weekends, no holidays. Seven years, just looking at a computer. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want that to be my job. I don't want to just sit and stare. I want to do the fun stuff, the physics, the discovery. So we need machine learning. We need artificial intelligence because I can't do it all myself. We can't do it all ourselves as astronomers. One way that machine learning can help with problems such as this image here is by helping us classify what is in them. In this, there's a lot of stuff we already know. I'm sure you've probably spotted a big, beautiful galaxy in there. And I could stand here and explain to you that one of these things I think is a galaxy, one of these things I think is a star. Lots of stuff we already know. If I was to sit down and individually rank every object, it would take me forever. So what we can do is use supervised machine learning to help classify this. The algorithm that helps us the most is something called a convolutional neural network. It has revolutionized the way that we classify objects from images. And you can think of it as a little brain inside of the computer. 
What happens if it has neurons that train on images just like this that I've labelled and told it what it is and it creates its own functioning little mini brain. The neurons decide what decisions it makes based on the features it sees. They're very simple and they're very easy to train and when we do it right, they're incredibly powerful. We can take thousands of images of data and process them within the matter of hours, days maximum, and get our answers. It's revolutionary. It has changed the way we do astronomy. But that is just the tip of the iceberg, the very, very tip of what AI can do for us. You see, my job isn't just to classify everything that's in this image. My job is to discover the new things, the interesting things, the things we don't know exist yet. That's a very hard job. How do you look for something if you don't know what you're looking for? Often, the things we are looking for are something we call transients. They're changing over time, and they can be anything from supernovae, so dying stars, to black holes having a meal, and everything in between. These are so interesting because it's where the really high-energy, unique physics happens. And the, the good thing and bad thing, I guess, is that every single type of transient we've found in the past, we've done it by hand and eye. It's something we call serendipitous discovery. Someone didn't know they were looking for the transients, looking for a black hole burping or a star dying. They saw it in the data, and their human intuition told them it was important. My favorite example of this is the discovery of the pulsar. Pulsars are rapidly rotating dead stars, and as they spin, they shoot a beam of radio wavelength towards the Earth. What you need to know is that they are effectively invisible to all of our imaging telescopes. We didn't know they were out there. We might still not know they were out there if it wasn't for the work of Jocelyn Bell Bennell. She was a PhD student, and she was tasked with looking at paper printouts of data coming off a radio telescope they were commissioning by hand and eye. And what she found was those little anomalous blips you can see there. Something only a human could say, that's interesting, I'm going to investigate it further. She discovered the pulsar, and now we have an entirely new field of astrophysics, which dedicates our time to looking and understanding at these things. And it was a serendipitous discovery. It was made because Jocelyn was curious, and she had intuition to what was important. Two things that we often take away when we use machine learning. So how do we fix that? How do we put intuition and curiosity back in? One way is to do something called unsupervised machine learning. And personally, this is my favorite area of research currently. I could talk your ear off. But the gist is we let the data do the talking for us. We go in with no preconceived ideas of what we're looking for. And instead, we let the data speak for itself. One of the best examples in astronomy is something I work with a lot, and that's called a light curve. It's the change of brightness over time, and we can make it for any astronomical source out there. They're very simple. At one point, I had made millions of these on a supercomputer, and if I had to look at all of them, I would probably still be sitting at my desk looking as I speak now. It's an enormous task, but we can use unsupervised learning to help us along the way. So what we do is we break down a light curve like this into a set of features. Somehow we describe it with single numbers. Or you could think of it as the slope of the curve or the median value. We feed these features into something we call a clustering algorithm. Now clustering algorithms are pretty remarkable. They're able to group like data with like data. And you can imagine that is extraordinarily powerful when you have data that you're trying to mine, trying to understand. This is very, very powerful. But remember, I'm looking for things that are new and unusual. We've never seen before. There's probably not very many in the universe. Clustering can also help us with that because what it can do is outline the outliers and the anomalous sources. Those that are too weird, they don't fit into any other groups. We haven't seen them before. It can help flag it all through the power of data and numbers. Now, unsupervised machine learning certainly is not perfect, but it does edge us a little bit closer to mimicking that human intuition of discovering something new and unusual. And this will become more important in the next decade as we build bigger telescopes and collect more data than we ever have before. Astronomers have to change. We have to adapt and evolve because otherwise we have too much data. It's a physical impossibility for us to look at it all. So what that means is astronomers like me need to rapidly improve our skills. The way I did that was learning how to utilize artificial intelligence. As I was learning this, I was doing it selfishly for me. 
I wanted to get through my data as quick as possible. I didn't want to sit at my desk for seven years straight. What I didn't realize, though, is the skills I was learning were completely transferable and applicable to other fields. Right now, I work in a project with psychologists and sports scientists using those AI skills to explore human cognitive and biometric data, something very different to exploring the cosmos. But all of that was possible because I had those AI skills. It's not just me. I have many colleagues and friends who were astronomers using their newly found AI skills and have entered different fields, from satellite imagery to medical imaging to even finance and stock markets. I think what I want to take away from all of this is that AI did take my job, took a big part of my job, and it made my job better. It improved my career, it made me a better scientist and a better astronomer. And so I don't get sad thinking about AI taking my job. I get excited thinking about what job it will take from me next. Thank you.